And those of you who are further along the journey, I know we have an opportunity to go deeper and to allow us to learn from you. This Blend Ed Symposium is about learning from one another, connecting, having conversations. And we hope that the program that we've set up both today at the pre-conference and over the next two days at the full symposium will give you lots of opportunities to engage in dialogue with your colleagues and to learn from one another. We have opportunities for dialogue built in throughout but we also have some spaces as we move forward if you need to step away for any reason. You know the food and coffee is back there. We'll have a coffee break at 10.30. And I'd like to stop talking and let someone more, much more important and much more uh, wise than I take the microphone. We are so honoured to have some fantastic presenters with us today to help us move forward with our journey. And our first presenter in this morning is Dr. Sean Lassard. Um, I was really fortunate to meet him face to face about a year ago for the first time and felt a kindred connection that I actually can't explain. It's like I knew him forever. And uh, it was a, a fantastic presentation that moved me in a really powerful way. And I'm so pleased that we can share that with all of you today. Um, his authenticity and the place of knowledge and love that he comes from is phenomenal and unparalleled in people that I've first met. I'm not going to tell you all his credentials because you've read them online um, because I really want him to have the opportunity to talk to you now. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Sean Lassard. Thank you. That was so nice. I appreciate that. I wish I need a copy of that for my mom. Yeah. <laughs> believe some of those things. I don't think she'd believe it. I was, I'm just, I, my mom's on my mind right now so much because uh, yesterday I was in North Balford, my, my, uh, one of my hometowns, one of my home places, and it's been, it's been a long time, so I have all these, uh, these memories just reverberating as I took that long uh, <coughs> drive from Edmonton to North Balford. It gives you a lot of thinking time with Johnny Cash in the background. <laughs> yeah. I'm thinking about <laughs> Thinking about some of those those darker years, you know, where I could have used some blended learning in my high school experience. That's for certain. It wasn't really the the norm. I don't think in uh, 1989 to 92 to really have a lot of blended uh, blended experiences. But I, I I knew I needed something. I couldn't put my finger on it, and I uh, but I can sure tell you I wasn't that, I wasn't very engaged in high school. So I go back there with my head down every single time I go there and just apologize to every teacher that I had in class. <laughs> For being so disengaged because I, I know I could have done better but in, in reality I, I didn't have much of a relationship with myself I didn't have much of a relationship with, with the intern with the school and I, I didn't have much of a relationship with uh, with teachers you know I was uh, kind of floating in and out and in between so I think there's probably resonance maybe with uh, with some of you in the work that you're doing is because you're trying to create always trying to create a different space you know and I, and I think it's beautiful even though I'm not a Technologically savvy person. Um, I, I, I was telling a story about Alec Kuros when I he, they recruited me to the University of Regina and Alec Kuros, uh, which probably many of you know in terms of that, that online world. And I, I didn't understand that online world. And he was interviewing me, and he was asking a question about uh, something called Twitter, which I had no idea about. And I, and, I, and he's like, "So do you think, Sean, that online is a way to develop relationships?" And I'm like, "No, I don't think. I don't think so." And I could just see him just quivering there at the table there and, and then just trying to, he tries to reframe the question. He goes, so you don't think there's any way online? I'm like, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. And, and then people are just looking around me because what I should have done, you know, in, in a technologically savvy world is maybe Google a little bit, see who's on my interview page and understanding that uh, what, what this was very, I was like crushing his heart. He said every word, every word I kept on saying, I was, I was breaking it down more and more. And he's like, I can't believe that we hired you. He goes like, and he goes, and he goes, you don't even know what Twitter is. I said, I, I never heard anything like that. I said, I, I said, I've been on Facebook for seven years. I said, I'm back on for the first time, and I got a lot of likes and pokes in the last twenty years. It's just, it's, 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 I just didn't even know what was going on. So you go dormant for a while, and it comes back there. I felt, I felt popular for a while. <laughs> but I, Al, Alec and I laugh now because. We, we, the more we sit down and actually talk about it, there's way more connections. Than I thought. I mean, there's way more connections than I ever imagined, you know, and I have friends in the room here that have also taught me that. So I think, I mean, even though that we're coming at this in a, maybe in a different way, because you're so savvy, 
with with technology and, and, and what's cutting edge. But really what we're what we're both th thinking about is trying to develop experiences. Experiences so you so people can engage in education, not school, in education. I think that's the commonality, right? And for me in my life, you know, I'm, I've, I've always, I suppose, been on the margins a little bit. So when I got to work in schools in a formal way, I was always trying to find that third space, that in-between space, that middle space where I could connect with people, where I could connect with kids who I also knew were on the margins. Because I remembered that. I, it, it lived in my bones. So when I, was, became, when I became a teacher, which I didn't think I'd ever be able to do, that I'm like, when I'm going to be in that school, when I'm going to work at that institution, I'm going to map it, I'm going to understand it, I'm going to study it, and then I'm going to find space where we can connect. So I think that's... That's good enough for today. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's what I've been thinking about a lot, and I, I'm so excited that we're here. And I walk in, and the first thing I'm with my with my, with my friend and colleague Etienne, who's going to be doing a little bit of work around, around the, the specific calls to action. She's gonna she's she's much more savvy in that area. Everybody's more savvy than me. I don't even know why I'm here right now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm thinking. I see the beautiful thing is I walk down here and there's a circle, and that, I can't, I can't wait to. To hear about it, I know I'll, I'll uh, touch base with Terry after. But you're going to be engaged in a process this afternoon. I think that is that is shifting. It, it's powerful. Uh, blank exercises. It's, it's a good thing. It's, but it's about the dialogue. It's about the dialogue that opens up different spaces to imagine. I think to imagine otherwise. So, so thank you, Dr. Thank you for what I mean. Thank you for uh, creating an open space for me right now because I, I actually can feel it right now. You know, I wonder in, in another world, in another way, if that online world, if you can, if you can also post questions and, and experiences where your learners can actually feel that, can we become connected in something that might be disconnected? I think there's a third space in there that we can be. I think it's about the dialogue, right? It's not just about writing questions and, and having just a cursory dialogue. It's about the types of questions that we open up the space to. I think that's, I think that's what matters and counts. So yeah, let's, let's start this. I, I, um, I, a lot of my work, I, I'm from uh, Montreal Lake Free Nation in northern Saskatchewan. I fly there, uh, I fly back to Saskatoon. Every other week I, I work, I advise uh, my chief of council on education. Um, right now we're in the midst of starting our first land-based education cohort. So I, I'm doing all the research around that to see what that looks like. So of course, even though I'm not technologically savvy, that is a blended type of learning because we're so much out in the field and we're, and we're out and we're, and, we're, and we're trying to imagine, we're playing again. It's taken so much for students and teachers to undo themselves because we've been so in the classroom for so long. And even first day teachers, very cultural teachers, language teachers are finding it hard. They're like, sorry, is this okay? Is this legal what we're doing right now? <laughs> it's, it's legal. It, it's okay to go out the water for the class and to have a dialogue about biology and to have a dialogue about what this might mean in terms of environmental sciences. To have a dialogue about your family, your friends, what some of the stories are here, the language and, 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 and creation, those are all okay things. And they said, but it just seems like we're cheating the system right now. So we're, it's, it's funny how we're so not giving ourselves permission, even though we have sovereignty to do that, but we're, we still have to give ourselves permission to see that this is okay. So I'm sitting there with my friends in a real linear way, showing them the outcomes and what they do is they tell me how we're gonna meander our way to get there. So I go through there in that Western way. That's one good thing about my life. I learned some Western, Western ideas about outcomes. And then my community, they, sh they tell me how they're going to make that happen. I think that's what I learned in a different way. A lot of my work was in Edmonton, in this big, giant high school. And, and a lot of times when I start the keynote speech, and I, and I apologize to you, those who have read this before, but I, I, I read a small piece called The Red Warrant Runners. It's a story that uh, young people, it's what they call themselves, in Enoch Cree Nation uh, around seven years ago when they said, let's do something different, Lassard. We can do something different. We want to graduate, Lassard. Can we? It's just cheating, Lassard. No, it's not cheating. It's called education. And they, when they call themselves the Red Warm Runners, they're from Enoch. They call themselves the Red Warm Runners because they wore red t-shirts each day. And, we, and it started off as a small group, one, then two, then five, then 17, then 25, then 30 young people who wanted to do education differently, not school. So I, I, it grounds me when I read this because they're just right outside west of the city. Uh, many of the young people I work with, um, they're now in university, done university, that's because I'm getting older. 
you know, find me, um, and uh, or, or in the workforce. So I, I, I start here with this. Sometimes five, sometimes 18. One day 30, but every day through August, the Red Horn Runners have been inspiring me as we shuffle, sprint, and navigate our way down the dusty roads of Enoch Cree Nation, always wearing red, red t-shirts, that is. It's a beautiful thing to experience, and we always start the local school in the town site, stretching, slowly getting ready for a run. Sometimes I love this daily ritual, other times I loathe it. Depends on my body's feeling. But we stick together through this one day at a time. Girls, boys, young people, and older people like myself make this trek daily throughout August. Sometimes we run four kilometers a day, and we make sure to always jog by the community health center in the band office. It's interesting, because now people wave at us when we jog. They used to look at us with mistrust. There's doubt in their glances. They quietly shook their heads as they saw youth move in a different way. I like visiting with the youth about the run and how it feels. They say they love it, and I'm starting to believe it. As they log their kilometers and look towards the poster to see how far they're going, to see how far they've been. Did I tell you? You should see these kids run. It's beautiful. No training, no fancy gyms, just the town site, bumpy dirt roads, and truck imprints embedded in the earth. And then the sandy ground of the back roads toward the potato plantation. It's our target turnaround always. There's wheat fields and canola fields on each side. They seem to be our only fans some days, and they seem to wave us on when we move. You see, there's no judgments there. We run and the youth tell me they've never done this before. They've never seen the fields I described them. Never seen the beauty like I'm speaking. I'm hoping they think and they see it now. I'm hoping they see something different within themselves. We're all on a line, a long red line, staying as close together as possible. And when the red worn runners take off in the distance, it's magical. It takes me home every time we run, home to the gravel roads and the farms of my youth, to the wheat fields and barley fields, and the beautiful sounds and smells that I cannot imagine in the city. We see the reserves a beautiful place and we let ourselves see it this way, shifting what we see by running right through it. I think the kids don't put this past week as an elder's van pulled us over on Clumber 3 on that sandy dirt road and an old woman shook all the kids' hands out the window. Here we thought we were going to get scolded. But no, she said to keep it up, keep running. They're smiling like local celebrities. We all smile. It's the closest to fame we'll probably ever get, but it's the internal fame that we should be celebrating anyways. I also think the kids felt that when guest runners from the city started to join us on that run, when we ran past Elder Bob's house, there's a little red fox watching us on the driveway, watching the red worn runners sneak through the sandy obstacle course. You see, we talk about treaties, families, relationships, and the beauty of creation on these morning jobs. We're simply moving knowledge, as Basso might say. This is a living curriculum, a familial curriculum of knowledge. I do not think the kids would continue, but once again, it goes to show you how much I don't know. They showed up every day and they even run on their own these days. And now as September rolls in, I heard that the other day on the reserve, a couple people were running. They told the boys it was because of seeing them. I guess they are local celebrities after all. They laughed when they told me, I love those kids. It's a beautiful thing to, to watch Joe with his brain and Michael, they were running straight to the West. They ran at a pace I can only consider in my mind. They glide when they move. I wonder what they're thinking when they run. The Red Warren Runners will continue to be on them on mind as the leaves get ready to turn and the farmer swaths down the majesty to the left and the flowering yellow to the right. It's indeed a beautiful thing one I won't soon forget. I hope we all keep running. Sometimes five, sometimes 18, one time 30. Today it's just me. The Red Warren Runners inspired me to shuffle, sprint, and navigate my way down the dusty road to being our creation. Always wearing red, red t-shirts, that is. Thank you. I, I, I like reading that just not because it's, it's navel gazing, but it, it, it uh, takes me home no matter where I am. And I, uh, it reminds me of uh, some of my, my own ontological commitments, some of the commitments to experiences and, and experiences that shifted how I was imagining up education. Um, I mean, people say, like, Sean, so you got to set up a running club then. Well, I know I need to run more. I'm not in the best shape right now, but I, uh, it's not exactly what I was talking about. You know, there was kids in the school that said, Lassar, we want to graduate with our friends. What can you do? Can you help us? First, there was one, then there was two, then there was five, then there was seven, ten. And these young people we knew from uh, a local community, you know, Green Nation, just west of the city. I said, yeah, that's easy. You know what? Here's my assumption level thinking. You know, that's easy. Just sign up for summer school. I'll get you hooked up. You know, we'll figure out a class. No problem. That's easy. Sorry, you're not listening. 
I said, no, I, I said, I can waive the fees. Is that what you want? The well, sorry, you're not listening to this. We don't have transportation in the summer. There's no bus and our parents work, so how are we supposed to go to summer school? Well, there's a policy for it that I'm not thinking of. There's, some, there's a barrier that I'm, that I'm certainly not thinking with. I'm too quick, I'm too fast. I'm living in this city lifestyle and not really thinking, I'm not listening. I talked to my principal, who was an exceptional leader, who gave me the agency to say, Sean, just go for it. And she didn't put up barriers, she said, go for it and just track it and measure it and show me that it's actually gonna work. So she said, do what you think's best. So I talked to one, then I talked to two, then I talked to three and four non-First Nation teachers, but they are teachers who could think outside the box. There are young teachers who could be nimble, that could move in different ways, that, that could, when it's not a smooth line, a straight line, they could respond and, and react differently. And we taught Aboriginal studies, social studies, physical education, and a wellness class in the Enoch Nation. The first day of class, the kids start the class, they said, we'll be your teachers, you're not the teacher no more. Isn't that a beautiful thing to think with? That's a flipped classroom in a different way, isn't it? Because we actually had to give up that piece, that piece that puts us at ease in that classroom when students have to physically and travel metaphorically to our classrooms every single day, what do they leave it behind? So here we have to give up what we know, our comfort, our computer, our technology, the ways that we know, where we know where our books, our materials, just that zone that we have that is so safe where kids have to travel to. We don't have that anymore because the classroom was outside at Elder Bob's place in a garage is where we met. They wanted us to run just to get our mind going in the day. I hated them for that. But that was a good run to start the day. And we wore red because red t-shirts, get, people could see us on the dusty roads. So it just became something that was interesting to watch how that shifts through a community. And then people start to join us by accident. But we were moving and running. They're like, can we join, the, join this run? I'm like, why not? Why not? And then people from the city started to come. And it kind of keep people, the, the agency of these kids are saying, we're going to keep on going. So if we quit right now, then what do I say about this? And they teach us a lot. One, two, three, four teachers who had never been on a reserve before. The first day of the class, they said, is, we're gonna, you guys are going to meet us at the powwow. Imagine two blonde teachers that just started off and never been on the reserve before. They said, start with the hell are we doing right now? We're going to a powwow? I'm like, yeah, just, just trust the process. That's not helpful, trusting the process, eh? They have no <laughs> idea what's going on. They're like, I don't understand what it means. Can you be more clear with me? Just trust the process. Just go with it. Go with the flow. That still doesn't help out. We actually physically don't know how to get out there. We don't know the directions. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just come with me. I'll take you in my vehicle. We will go there. We will meet the people. And the kids are waiting for us. And they said, meet my family. Meet my auntie. Meet my uncle. Meet my mom. Meet my community. Well, that just changed everything. You know, I'm friends with those teachers. Uh, still, one of the most profound experiences. One of them's actually come back. She's my graduate student right now. Not my graduate student. She's a graduate student. That's ownership. But that. She's a graduate student, and she's actually gonna, she's going to write about some of these experiences. But she's actually now working with, uh, with immigrant and refugee families who just have started off kindergarten. She's learned a lot from that experience. She sat on the margin. She goes, "You, you ruined me, Lassar." She goes, "Because that experience showed me at the beginning of my teaching that we can actually do things different in education in schools." So I've been in the, the margins in every single school I'm at, and I absolutely love it. She's a math teacher. I remember walking out with her, and uh, I, I was just going to go on the project manager. I do some teaching. I'm, I'm all over the place. I just want to make sure people are feeling comfortable. And I, I'm like, I can't find the damn math class. They're like, where, where, where are these 10, 10 boys that were in this class that are, that, are, that are studying math with her? And I'm like, I can't find them. And I, and I drive by the golf course. And I see them just like this, just boom, just hit, just hit. I'm like, I walk up. How is this? What are you, what are you guys doing? Just having a, like, uh, just take your time for yourself. We're doing math. Start. We love this lady, but we hate her. She had we have our tech leaders over here to start. People are yelling at us on the golf course because we're uh, we're measuring angles right now and, and, and judging distance. Small things, but big things. But she had that relationship in young people who are struggling with math flourish in that place. I started learning a little math in that way. Is that if you have that relational piece, you get people here, you can move all kinds of ways. And she had young people that resisted mathematics so much that were actually getting on board in a different way. They made math t-shirts at the end. I said, that's just super nerdy. You guys slow it down now. <laughs> they said, sir, we don't want you for a teacher anymore. We'll take her. She makes us cookies every single day. That's blended learning. <laughs> so I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about the early experiences that are shaping influences that we all have. So 
I'm always asking the question, I wonder what brought you to the places that you're in. You know, why are you on the margins in, in a good way? You know, that's, that's, that's a question. I, I can't wait to, to engage in that dialogue because we've got to keep on thinking together. It's not me just sharing things. It's a transactional experience because I always take something with me home through these conversations. I'm like, oh, I never thought about that. That's good. That's good. That's, 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 this is a good space. People ask me, so let's start when you're in school, be more literal with me. I'm like, well, when I'm thinking about this, I, in the schools that I work with, in maybe part of my school life, I didn't feel like there, there was any space, there's no space. So when I end up working with youth in these large institutions, there's no space for this. There's no space for that cup of tea to linger a little bit. And I'm always looking for space to have different dialogical conversations and to imagine different ways we could take up the, the subject matter. The subject matter becomes secondary. You know, we take up the journey together, and whatever that is. See if you can read that. We regret to inform you. There's currently no space or place for abstract thinking. I kind of think that's like my passion sometimes. And I'm not knocking education. I'm not, I'm not in school, I'm not in school. So they're saying like, so Sean, what do you, what do you do? I said, well, I try to disrupt gently. I try to study it. I try to map the landscape and try to understand what the, what part of the institution I'm in and to actually literally map it. So I could begin to gently disrupt it, to try to turn another, another angle, to try to look at it a different way, to try to get a different experience that's going to be sustaining. That's always what my focus is. That's what I'm doing right now. As soon as I leave this, I'm, I know to be not actually to go work at junior high class. That's having some struggles. I can't wait to get my ass kicked today. <laughs> it's going to be beautiful. Two teachers quit. I said, thanks a lot for thinking of me. I appreciate that. But I want to know, I guess it's not about the teachers quitting. I want to know about uh, what's keeping them up at night. You know, why are you resisting so much? Let's sit down and have a cup of tea. Let's not worry about content right now. We got other things to worry about. We can get to content later, but I need to know why you're hurting right now is the best, best question. So when people are asking me, I said, you know, you got to find your space. When I'm working with teachers right now in my life, I said, you got to find those spaces, those spaces that are going to sustain you within the institution. The spaces most likely that I'm finding over time, you know, when I do research and studies with people who drop out of school, I, I work with high school youth that dropped out. That's my research area. And now my, my secondary research area is teachers who leave, leave school. They drop out a different way. The places that sustain them are, are mostly people. People and sometimes subject matter. Subjects that, that count and matter where they can see themselves within it. <coughs> Find your space. <laughs> I see, just moving that image, and I'm like, that seems so difficult. Why does it have to be so hard to find that, right? It's almost impossible to find that. So conceptual, not pragmatic, right? I said, but there are pragmatic ways where we can get there. There are ways we can get there instead of just talking philosophically. I guess it's about creating space. I said, you know, it's about whatever experience that we have, whether it's it's this in the classroom or, or online or in between, it's about creating space. And I'd actually even now take that a step further. It's not about creating space because if it's me creating space, that's top down. It's about co-creating space. How are we going to co-create space? And I work with teachers that are just getting ready to go in the field and they kept on saying, oh, sir, thanks for creating the space. This is so different. For creating the space, I said, we co-create the space. I can't create it if you don't give me the space to actually imagine something different with you. If you resist me all the time, I can't do that. You're taking me along. You're taking me home with you in a different way. By opening it up a little bit, by doing some inward thinking, by being a little bit vulnerable so we can grow together. Because we're doing something radically different within this institution. And we're all institutionalized beings. We're all institutionalized beings. I mean, we grew up in school. I'm still hanging out in schools. It still works on me. I know when... when uh, I know when fish and chips are on, on Wednesday at uh, Jim Tesla Place High School Cafeteria, I know at 11.15 my stomach gets a little grumble and I'm, and I'm, and I'm craving fish, like narcotics. <laughs> fish and chips, I don't know what that guy put in those fish and chips, but I love them, and it's in my mind still. 
and then I shift this to a different way. And these are the things I've been writing about and thinking about. And it's a little bit content heavy in terms of just words. But I've been thinking a lot about relational ethics when we talk about this. So allow me just to read this. So I'm thinking about engagement. Language and the definition has to do with the commitment or pledge. That's actually what engagement means. It means becoming a mesh or interlock. So when I'm talking about engagement, I'm talking about also what is our ethic, what is our relational ethic in classrooms and, and the, type, the types of spaces that we're creating. And I'm writing about relational ethics in research, relational ethics in education. What does that look like in, a, in, in particular with indigenous people? Dossiter, who's a health ethicist, says, I'm thinking that maybe nurturing ethics involves nurturing the space between people and nurturing the ability to extend oneself into that space. Let that linger for a little bit. <coughs> nurturing the space between people and nurturing the ability to extend oneself into that space. When I think about that in that way, it certainly seems similar to what you're actually trying to imagine in the work that you're doing. Extend one's, extends one's oneself. A focus on relationship that suggests our ethical commitment is grounded in our everyday relations to each other. This focus on relationship affirms the particular over the universal with attention to the context in which people live. The most important line for me on that part is a focus on relationship that affirms the particular over the universal. When I'm thinking about that, I'm thinking about the particular, I'm thinking about the opening, I'm thinking about that acknowledgement. I'm thinking about the particular in the stories, not the general, not FNMI. The specifics, the particular, the nuances, the details, the culture, the stories, the language, the protocols, the process. What does it mean to be living in Treaty 6 right now? What does it mean to be living in Edmonton, in a Miskwachis, in Beaver Hills House? What does it mean? What are some of the stories? If we strip past uh, some of the buildings past, that's what Dwayne Donald talks about all the time, it reminds me, is that strip those buildings back, Sean, and just imagine, help yourself imagine what, what this place looked like, what did this space look like at one time. When I'm working with youth, I, I'm, I'm really trying to work at trying to understand the particular in their life, not the general. Because those details help me move in a more informed way. They're my data, if you will. Relational ethics, then, is that flow that's made possible by a focus on the space between us, a space in which we can nurture ethical discussions and develop ethical thoughts. So what does this space look like in your school? What does this space look like in our relationships? And I can extend that further. Can we create that space online or somewhere in between? I think we can. I also think school can't be a home place. I really do. If I think about it as a metaphor, I do believe that we could do that. I do believe that. People have good intentions. They do believe that it's possible. That's me and my kid, my bad grade two kid, going to school. You know, and I, I think about that. I don't put that up. I, just, I don't put it up just because it's <laughs> – I put it up because I'm asking the question, I wonder, what do we give up when we send our kids to school? What do we give up, you know? I mean, what, what are we asking? You know, what, you mean, I mean, what are we asking for in this, in this relationship? I'm thinking about that when – Kids come to your schools and they engage with you. you know, what, what, what is it that their parents want? What is it that they want? You know, what, what are they? What are we asking? You mean I, I want a I want an ethical relationship. I want a relationship that's back and forth, that's filled with reciprocity. I don't want people to to go top down on my daughter. I want I want her to be part of that solution. I want her to be able to get books in that tell her stories about who she is and who she's becoming. I mean, those are the things that I'm looking for. But I also recognize many, many spaces for the last year. I walked to be able to find space because they locked me out. I can't open the door. They locked me out uh, metaphorically, physically. But I think the most important part, which is difficult to measure spiritually, because I could feel my stomach. I could read it on the posters on the walls. I could read it in the person who talked to me and met me at the very front door, you know, and uh, that wasn't actually open, that open no space that asked me more questions with mistrust than trust. That's too easy to read after a while. I don't have a metric for it, but my stomach's pretty good. And you can feel it. So now we trans we transition to the dark years. That's what I call some of these experiences. I just wrote them up that I, you know, when I'm working with young people, 
And when I'm thinking about these pieces is that I have to continue to write about them. I have to continue to do some inward dwelling because if I don't travel to my own stories, then how am I supposed to understand the stories, the existential stories, the stories on the school landscape? I have to kind of do some traveling, traveling to some of my experiences. And people say, oh, sir, well, you know what? You're a role model. I'm like, I, please don't call me a role model. Because when you put something up, it's always going to come down. I said, I'm just a person that got, got a good opportunity in my life. In my early years, I started off in Montreal, like Cree Nation. And my mom struggled for a long time. And then I get shipped out to, another, to one place. And then I go back to Montreal Lake when she got healthy again. And then I get shipped out to another place on the list. And then back to Montreal Lake. And then out. And then uh, probably did that six, seven times. And I finally got picked up on waivers in a, in a place in North Alpha, Saskatchewan. A farm family said you could stay a while. They didn't, they, didn't, they, didn't tr they didn't trust the process at the beginning. But over time, they said you could stay a while. And, I, and I'm so thankful for that experience. A non-Indigenous family. So it's always been a little bit of a, a mystery, especially on family photos when everybody's blonde in that family. There's just me. People have a lot of questions around the, around the old campfire in rural Saskatchewan. They don't know what to say. There's some awkward silences. They say, who's this guy? I'm like, it's a long story. <laughs> it's a long story. But these, that travel, I think, in between is actually what has filled me up in a different way because it's allowed me to kind of see some different worlds in, in a good way, even though there's bad repercussions from some of those things. They used to call me the sleep police when I was in Edmonton. My first job was here in, um, in Edmonton in Macaulay area, and I worked with young people, you know, in, in transition. We were trying to get back to school. Sleep police. I used to just go to their house and say, hey, let's have breakfast because I was hungry anyways. And then I'd pick the kids up and we'd go to school. <laughs> and and, all, and all, the, all the families, they begin to know me. They start just don't even worry about it. Just walk in. I said, I can't. That's getting over, overboard. I don't need to walk in. Let's have some, uh, some barriers, but... I go and I, we have the most unbelievable meals as, as, a, as a youth worker. And being a youth worker, not only in Edmonton, but in Saskatoon, but since I was 17 years old, being a youth worker taught me that I have to find alternative spaces to connect with kids. Because how am I supposed to create safe spaces in the community when you don't know how to get them, how to get to them, how to reach them? So I was always looking for alternative ways, and I think that's what stayed with me. That's been a great teaching. I'm thinking about things right now. I'm thinking about experiences. I'm thinking about North Battlefield, Saskatchewan. I shared that story yesterday. I'm thinking about my first job right now that I got. When I thought, I imagine when I'm graduating from my education degree, that I'm going to get a job teaching in high school. It's just going to be smooth lines. I, I got a job as a kindergarten teacher. <laughs> I started off there. There's no jobs. I graduated in December, and there's no jobs. So I said, you know what? I'll do what I know to do. I'll be a teacher assistant. So I'm like, I'll take whatever job I'm going to get, and that's, that's going to be great. And I phone my mom. I'm like, Mom, I'm pumped up right now. This is my mom on the reserve. And I say, Mom, so i got multiple moms going here. And I said, she, I said what's, what's, what's the story? She goes, oh, you're so happy. Like, what's, what school? Is it, you know, is it, it's, it's, it's a nice little, nice little city school? Like, what, what? tell me more, son. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's a really awesome job, Mom. It's, uh, it's called institutional services. And she's like, okay. <laughs> That doesn't sound like the school. I think of like Maple Elk or something like that. Or something like really nice. Name. My mom's very thoughtful. No, 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 mom. You gotta hear me out. It's, it's institutional services. I'm gonna be a teacher assistant, and I, I graduate my degree, mom. This is great. Everything's it's all arrows up. And you know, this is a school where every kid who's been kicked out of the district goes to school. I can't wait, mom. I don't know why I sent you that city. She says. <laughs> And so I'm sitting there as a teacher assistant and getting my first job. I'm just happy, just happy learning in this class, in this elementary classroom, which I never imagined I'd be an elementary teacher. And I'm just enjoying myself with a master teacher, having great dialogue, and life is good. My paycheck's probably around 2000 I'm thinking life is really good. And I could buy pizza all the time. <laughs> no commitment. Life is good. And then the principal comes in the classroom. He said, hey, I'm sorry. Are you a teacher? I'm like, yes, I believe in children. Yeah, I, uh, I, uh, I, believe, that, I believe in the future. I'm, I'm quoting a Whitney Houston song. <laughs> the children are our future. Yeah. And, and he's like, I, I'm not asking you for your, your, full, your philosophy, man. I'm not asking for your school philosophy. So Canon, he's stopping. He goes, I'm asking you. I'm going to be more literal. Do you have a teaching degree? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Why the hell didn't you tell me that? He goes, like, why did, there's jobs here all the time. I don't know. I just, I'm just going with it, man. I'm like, he goes, well, you're starting. I'm going to give you a teaching job. I'm like, well, that is awesome. Like, see, if you put out good energy in the world, good things are going to happen. You know, I read that in some, some stupid book. <laughs> and, and I'm like, this is great. I mean, he's like, okay, so you're going to be starting next week. You're teaching kindergarten. I'm like, no, 
anymore. I'm not teaching kindergarten. I don't do. I, I'm not. I'm not. I, I can't do kindergarten. I'm a. I'm a high school teacher. I'm not. I'm not an elementary teacher. I don't know how to do that. I'm not. Little kids don't like me either. Why would you do that? He goes, no, no, no. You're teaching kindergarten. He goes, that's that's all there to it. That's all there is to it. I said, well, how big is this class? I'm like, I'm gonna get sleep. I don't. I don't know anything about this. Is not easy. And I'm telling you, little kids hate me. And he's like, uh, there's only two kids. Oh, shit. I got that. This is the easiest job of my life. I've got that. So I phoned my mom. I'm so happy. I'm like, Mom, guess what? I'm a teacher now. Like, I'm a kindergarten teacher. And then I had to do some thinking on that weekend. I'm like, I don't know how to teach kindergarten. So I was like going to chapters and every teacher study thing going online. And I'm like reading in the bureau by myself. Like, this is I don't know how to do backwards reading. And I'm, like, I'm, I'm practicing. I'm playing the Nicholas. I'm, I'm trying to make, like, I'm cutting stuff up. I, I'm, re I'm rereading Harry Wong, like, the first day of teachers. <laughs> the second edition. <laughs> I'm like, I've got this. This is, is going to be great. <laughs> God, I hate kindergarten. <laughs> I, I try to keep stuff all the time. And I have, this is my class. Just think about this picture. They, I don't think they needed to. They, they should have rethought this, too. They made some assumptions. Our classroom photo, everybody has a picture that this is my class, me and my two sons. It's, like, <laughs> it's just this awkward pose because these kids hate me and they, it's just a tough, tough uh, relationship. <laughs> Beautiful kids. I didn't really think this job through, like six hours with two kids, kindergartens. And, and here's the second part of the book I didn't think through. How do you get kicked out of kindergarten? <laughs> I never thought about that. So we're, we're only, we're not even December right now. These guys are already kicked out of kindergarten. And I'm just happy to take the job. Hey, I'm, I'm so pumped. I'm like, okay, so I should have really thought that through. How did they get dismissed from kindergarten already in kindergarten? <laughs> One of the second week of school, I'm in that classroom and I'm trying to do what Harry Wong says and don't be too large, you know. You know, use your soft voice. You're a big man. You know, try to be small. Like, I'm just like, just, I'm, I'm like, so I remember just like, just trying to just, I don't know what I was, I loved to videotape it, Randy. I, I really wanted to see what I was doing in there. I'm just like, Harry. And I remember walking up to the young man there in the class, one of my only two students. And I got to tell you what, I, 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 I admire education and attendance. I, they were there every damn day, no matter what. They, they had a cold. They had the flu. They were like the sick as could be, but they were there every day. So there was there was no there was no free rides here. So one of my two students, I go down because I'm like the proximity. I don't want to be big here. So I go down on my one knee and I just whisper in his ear. I'm like, Hey, little buddy, you want to do a little bit of math, a little bit of reading? This kid punched me in the face so hard. <laughs> he left across me so hard. My nose was leaking. I'm just like this. I'm just appalled. Okay? He played. He stunned me like Jose Batista. <laughs> and I'm just staggered. I go to my principal's office. He goes, "How in the hell does that happen with two little kindergartens?" He goes, "I go, I, I don't know." I uh, I whispered in his ear, "Little buddy, do you want to do some math or reading?" He goes, "You whispered in his ear. Did you read the IPP that I put on your desk?" I don't do that. I learned at teacher college in the university that you don't make judgments of people. You don't make assumptions about your students. You don't want to look at that. You keep it closed always. You never want to make assumptions because that would redefine their relationship. He says it right on the front of that. He says, if you open it up, you did. He said, it says, don't close talk this kid. He doesn't like that. So uh, wipe yourself off. Read the IPP after school. Shake it off. Go for a little walk outside. Get back in there. I said, well, you got you to do some discipline here. The discipline is you didn't read your IPP, buddy. He said, like, <laughs> I just come back in there with God and just humiliated. And just like, our relationship grew and grew and grew and grew. Metaphorically and physically, we, we even grew one of those, those little kindergarten trees that you grow. You know, and I drive by that place all the time and I curse at that tree when I go by. <laughs> but it was an unbelievable experience. I'll tell you what, I... Uh, I have mad respect for kindergarten teachers and elementary teachers. Uh, in fact, a lot of times when I work at high schools, what I do is I, when I'm on the, the hiring committee is I hire elementary teachers to work at high school because they learn so much about actually how it is to teach, how to learn, how to read, and all these pieces that I was missing in my secondary training. It changed the way I think. And God, was it hard work, man. No breaks there. I hate to go to the bathroom there. And the place say, you know, in my high school, my, my, my fluffy high school life was pretty, it was, it was pretty nice. <laughs> No fish and chip dinners every Wednesday. Not in elementary. I just just sat there because we weren't allowed to go outside. We had to work our way up to our, our, our little classroom community of three. So that's what I'm thinking. 
I'm thinking about different experiences that were shaping influences. I put up their uh, vintage couches and 1,234.62. You know, it's a number that I like keeping in my mind. I kept every stub from my first job, 1,234.62. I was a teacher assistant youth worker in Saskatoon. And there's a wonderful person that gave me an opportunity. I had no experience working with kids. I was selling fruit on the side of the road in Victoria, BC. And she said, what do you do? Well, like, are you mean, how are you going to help kids? I said, well, I know the difference between different grapefruits and I can smell between oranges. And she's like, what does that have to do with kids? Not much, but I said, I'm really good at it. And she goes, you got the job? <laughs> she goes, that's the first time anybody's ever answered that way. And she became one of my most important people in my life, a significant mentor, a non-First Nations person. She has her master's degree. She was a counselor. She taught me how to reshape behavior. When kids told me to fuck off, she said, it looks sideways. She goes, don't react to what they're saying. There's a reason they're hurting right now. Think about that. Don't look at the behavior. Think about what might be happening. What a reframing of questions. Sorry for the language. But it helped me out so much to, that never, ever bothered me anymore after that. I was always ask him, well, why, 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 why might that be happening? Don't react to the, to the language, right? And I used to always react to the language. You can't say that. I never, I, after that moment, at 19 years old, I never, ever asked that question. You can't say that. Reshifting reshaping, reframing. She was an unbelievable person. She's an unbelievable person. She's uh, retired now. Uh, she wanted to be, she was a counselor, a psychologist, and I learned so much from her. And then that second year, she said, you can't come back anymore. So am I getting written up? I said, if I make $2,000 a month, I'll be the richest man in, the, in, the, in my community. She said, no, you need to go back and study at the university. I need you to go to the university. I'm like, I don't, I don't uh, I'm shut down. I said, uh, people in my family and my white family from the farm, they don't go to university. People in my community in Montreal Lake, no one ever go to university. I said, so I, I actually don't know how to do that. I don't, I'm not, I don't, I, I don't have enough confidence in myself. I, I'm, I'm, I can't do that. Yes, you can. So she's my boss. She put me in classes that year. She took me to campus and taught me to have a cup of tea on campus and to feel good about there, to feel 10 feet tall having a cup of coffee there. To, to fit when you belong, like even when there were student things going on, on campus and it seemed like so foreign to what I was actually used to, to sit in that with me just made me just feel stronger and stronger than to sit in our friend's class and to practice writing an essay because I, I, I story myself as not a good writer. I'd never written uh, formal essays. I had a 52% overall grade average in high school. I was disengaged. And just feeling a confidence and actually the toughest part of the process was actually learning how to fill an application that way. She helped me with that. It's not easy. It sounds like an easy thing, but that's a huge transitional piece, right? That changed me. So I went to the Indian teacher education program in that first year and came out uh, as a, as a the dean's honor roll, only one hour class. I never missed one class. That was the most unbelievable experience. And then I fell in love with books. I hung out with the library. Didn't meet a lot of girls on campus though these days. I was hanging out in the library, which is a good place. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share that. That's good. That was a good place. I just focused on that because I could see... In my life, if I stay with this, now I've got a game plan. Those early reminders are reminders for me how I work with kids right now. That if you can't see where you're going to go, if you can't imagine otherwise, then, then it becomes very difficult to see why would I stay in this place. Why would I engage with you if I can't see any other possibilities? So how do we help take those steps with young people? How do we animate that path? How do we animate lives? That's a question I have. And I think we could do that in multiple ways. I think what you're doing and some of the programming that you're in about, that's, that's, what you're, that's what you're trying to help them imagine up. But it's about keeping that imagination open. Through those years, those dark years of kindergarten, I moved on. I got recruited to the high school. That's where I belong. You know, and I was like so happy. They're going to give me a job at this high school. And I'm like, it's going to be the most amazing job because this job is by the most important place in Edmonton. It's right beside West Edmonton Mall. And I'm like, that is awesome. This is going to be the best job. And the job that I have, they said, is you're going to work with every kid in the high school year that gets kicked out. I'm like, I didn't understand that my job should have just been at the West Edmonton Mall. Hey? And I didn't understand how much I hate West Edmonton Mall now. I remember I was teaching a social studies class in the morning in my class. Too. Quite a few of the students were there. And I walked by West Edmonton Mall, the water park, and by the food park. And there's like one of my students waving at me at the slide. Just like this, just having the greatest time of his life. I'm like... So, man, why, are you serious? He goes, I'm like, are you serious? Like, he goes, 
the start, 50% day off, I couldn't miss it, man. It's a great deal. You talk about that all the time. <laughs> he said, so you missed my class for it, and you're just going to, no, no, no problem at all. And he goes, you can't miss 50% day off, man. We're just, we're having a time for our life to start. I'm like, that is just unbelievable. Unbelievable. But I had this awesome job uh, working in a school, and when I talk about no space, trying to find space, this is what I, I was imagining. Um, in this gigantic school, there's 2,600 youth at Jasper Place. There was over 100 staff members at that time. And I ended up, what they said is like, Sean, you're going to work with First Nation students, First Nation Native Native students. And at that school, there's 250 self-identified First Nation Native Native students. So in this school, my job was to try to create a portfolio to actually work with youth in a different way. I remember the school district phoning me right at the very beginning, said, let's start this week, you're going to do Right at the very beginning of the school year, just get on the microphone and uh, or the, or the uh, intercom. Just call them all down like here and just introduce yourself. That's your that's best practice right now. I'm like, <laughs> and I just said, is it? When's the last time you were in a classroom? I said, the, the people on the phone. They're like, um, this is best practice. You need to do it. I said, well, what am I supposed to say to them? Like, I don't drum, I don't dance. I said, what do you want me to do? She goes, just do something cultural. <laughs> That's the serious response that I got from the downtown office. Do something cultural. I said, I'm never going to do that. Because imagine yourself as a grade 10, 11, or 12 student being hauled out of your class. I mean, A, I've never talked to their parents or their guardians to see, is that okay? Secondly, I'm not in a relationship. You're making a huge assumption that they want to be in a relationship with me. And three, I'm further marginalized them by doing that in front of their peers. I said, I really question that. I don't think, I think that's a fast way to get a checkbox. I said, that's not, a, that's not a good way to be in a relationship. I said, I'll do something better if you give me one period a day. I said, I'll meet with every single one of these young people with permission from their parent or their guardian, and we're going to talk about what life looks like in school, and we're going to have a cup of tea. I said, it'll be done by the end of October. I said, I'll find more information in that cup of tea than you ever will in that big, gigantic group. And I said, prove it. And so I did. And then we started calling it 250 Conversations. 250 Conversations was our data collection. And it was something that we, uh, our philosophy that we live with in that school. It shifted the way we imagine all kinds of things, right? From policy to programs to high school completion to the types of classes that we engage with. We reintroduced Aboriginal Studies 30. We started a smudging policy. We created a space because for the longest time we smudged outside. I smudged outside by myself. They repurposed the room so we could actually smudge within the school. We created a cultural safety space for the school. So you started something called Lean Spirits. They've traveled to Finland and worked with Posse Silver. I haven't traveled to Finland and worked with Posse Silver. They've done some amazing things. And the, the beautiful thing about it, it all starts with a cup of tea. You have to believe me. Because I go back to Joshua Place, I'm going to go back to this afternoon, I'm going to go check on the kids again and see how it's going. I'm going to say, where's my t-shirt? And I say, they'll say 25 bucks, sir. <laughs> So mapping the landscape. So we identified a continuous need to have intentional conversation with youth to help create, and the most important part for me is sustain a vision at the starting in between middle and exiting points of school. Could this be possible in other places? Could this be possible in your places? The question that I've learned from my friends is we no longer ask the question what pertains you, we ask the question what sustains you. Kids are like, what are you talking about the start? Like that's a weird question. I, I wanna know what sustains at school. I'm not interested in retention, I'm interested in what's sustained here. And we break down that question, and we go through this, and we ask that question again, and again, and again, and students will tell you all kinds of wonderful things that I never even thought possible, that I wasn't even thinking about. Because of course, I'm so busy in my everyday life, that when I'm doing an 80 minute class, when I'm teaching an 80 minute class, there's no space for me to get to those conversations. When I'm running through the hallways, I can give a high five, but that, that's just a high five in between space. There's no dialogical space where I'm really asking. Where I'm reacting in intervention ways to what happens usually when the students are struggling, you know, the 25% students are struggling. I'm reacting. I'm not responding. I'm missing this, all the students in between. So I'm thinking about that and, and the work uh, that I'm doing because we need to create forward looking stories in school, but you need to have the dialogue to help like, help myself to understand that. I want to give you an example, a practical example of why this mattered to me. When I did something, you mean, I, we used to do things because this is what we always did in school. So we always go to the University of Alberta for, uh, 
for a welcome back day for Indigenous students. We always do it for, for seven years, and I guess for years before that they did that. And then finally I started asking the question, how many of you, this is such a ridiculous question, how many are actually interested in going to the University of Alberta? I think there's 20 students. I said, then why are we bringing 250 students to the University of Alberta? We're making a real assumption that all kids want to go to university. Not that it's a bad experience, but if, we're, if it's time sensitive, you mean, why don't I ask you different questions? So what is it that interests you? What matters? I want to be a welder, sir. Well, let's connect you to the best welder in town. Let's connect you in conversation and dialogue. Let's set up a phone interview. Let's set up a cup of tea. Let's find out more about what you're interested in. So what I'm trying to say is that through those dialogical pieces, we began to understand small pieces that were, were, were matter, that were more connected, that were more particular, not general. I slowed down a lot. I listened a lot better. I go through a whole afternoon session with leading spirits because they because every once a month they had a meeting they could invite local people and whoever they wanted. And I'd go through the whole hour and I wouldn't say a word. That's real hard for me. But it's youth for youth led by youth. So my job was just to sit and have a couple passes with them and then just listen. I put my hands on my I'm on the seat and say okay no matter how this goes it's just their space. Things started to turn differently. I learned a lot. I learned a great deal. I put that slide up. University of Regina hates that they use that slide. But what I'm trying to say is that when I'm working in the classrooms, is that I'm always trying to round the edges of those classrooms. I just try to round them a little bit. And that's what the intentions that I'm making. That's what the kind of practices that I'm trying to follow. My pedagogy, my process, I'm trying to round the edges a little bit. I'm trying to round the edges. Mapping the landscape. I talk to the youth about this time, all, all the time about what matters and what counts. When I do school evaluations right now across Canada, I actually ask for the students to always lead it. The principals really get mad at me. At the beginning, I said, I, I want two youth to lead the process for me. I'm going to step into your school and I want them to, to take me through. And they're going to lead me to the places that matter, the places that sustain them. And I, I, I'll come back and talk to you after. Because I know if I go with the principal, they're going to show me the, the, the shiny places. But I know that young people are going to show me the, the shiny places, the places that matter, the places that they got concerns about. It's such a raw conversation. It's very, very helpful. What, what a dialogue. Map of the landscape. Sometimes the landscape looks like this. Back home. Sometimes it's an urban landscape. Sometimes it's in between back and forth and in between. So when I'm talking about identity, I don't want to make assumptions about people's lives, that everybody is a cultural person, that everyone follows a singular protocol and process because we know there's different teachings in different places. When I'm in Blackfoot territory, we pray this down. And when I'm in Cree territory, I often we stand. And then when I'm going up north and uh, really northern areas, you know, a lot, a lot of those places are, are very, uh, very Christian, very Anglican. You know, so there's all kinds of things going on, and we never want to make assumptions that there's a one singular way to, to think about these pieces, about identity. Learning to listen sideways. When I'm engaged with youth, to try to listen to those stories that are particular. To try to understand different by creating opportunities in the institution that allow us to think differently, to create differently, like art, like music to create and then to understand each other through those pieces, to disrupt what's going on and to try to move to a different type of flow, a different rhythm, right? Even when we're going right there in this standard process, 80 minutes, 80 minutes, 80 minutes block of time, I'm trying to find other ways to engage, to stop that, to stop Groundhog Day teaching, and to learn to listen sideways. put the slide on there because my friend and I were talking when we were in the school together we created a course called indigenous permaculture and we talked about meandering to the outcomes there was no aboriginal studies going on in the particular high schools that we were working at and aboriginal high school aboriginal studies been around for a long time but by talking to youth we knew that we couldn't get we didn't have the we didn't have the capacity in the school to teach aboriginal studies 10 20 30 or the knowledge or the or the wherewithal or the political stamina to do that from a leadership level. 
So I said, well, why, I, I know that in other classes, why would I go 10, 20, 30? Why would I go 30, 20, 10? Because 30 is connected right to university and college. I made a fiscal case to the principal. We had Aboriginal studies, 30. One of the most successful courses at Center High right now where we introduced it, there's four, four blocks per semester of Aboriginal studies, 30. One of the highest populations of students taking that class are, are Muslim and immigration students. Students who just come with newly to Canada, immigrant students. And when I asked them, why is this the way they said because it's the only place we can talk about spirituality? He said, Lassard, a lot of these things you're talking about, we, we know this from our own home places. And that class is just growing and growing. And man, we have cups of tea every single day. That's part of the pedagogy. Meandering to the outcomes, I'm saying that there's no straight lines that we have to look at in other ways, right? When we look at what the possibilities are. Indigenous permaculture, our end project was to build a medicine wheel garden. The, the, the other part of the outcome that we wanted is that an elder was going to co teach this class. And to get that through policy was difficult. But she was a co teacher, paid co teacher. So when we learned about biology and Aboriginal studies, we learned about networks and systems. We learned about, we made this medicine wheel garden and it had Latin, it had biological terms, it had English, and then it had Stony and Greek to honor our elder and honor this place. Still going. I got in a little bit of trouble for that one because the kids, the kids, I'm going to blame on the kids. <laughs> They're so smart. They're like, Lassar, we're tired of giving smokes for protocol. Can we just grow tobacco? Shit, that's a great idea. Let's do that. Hey, like, well, we have stocks of tobacco growing in that, in that garden. And the, the superintendent, is that, is that tobacco? <laughs> just don't worry about it. It's, just, it's all part of the plant process. <laughs> and then now they have some policy. You're not allowed to grow tobacco in your, in your, in your, in your community gardens. Hey? But what, what, how smart are these young people? They want that to happen. They wanted to bundle it because they wanted to offer tobacco from what they grew to, to elders and knowledge keepers in the community. That's engaged learning. That's their idea, not mine. I was like, wow, you, you are so smart. That is beautiful. Our attendants thrived in there. They all got an average of studies, 30 credit, and they learned about biology along the way. It was an unbelievable experience. I interviewed for every single position in that class. Because what happens, I know back home in Saskatchewan, so if you're a First Nations person, they just, you I mean, a lot of times the schools just say, okay, then you should go in Native Studies. That's kind of a disengaged way to think about that. So I said, I'm going to turn that around because what you're doing at the school level now is you're making this class deficit. You're making it deficit because just because you're brown and you're going to go in that class. I'm like, you know, I'm going to make it a place to come. I'm going to hold interviews. Geez, we had a list of interviews, you know, for, for that class. They had to come in there and they had to talk about what they're going to bring in that class. It was unbelievable. 20 First Nations students, 15 non-First Nations students. You know, I just love those non-First Nations students. And just imagine what their parents were saying for the first time. Like, yeah, I'm taking Aboriginal Studies 30, permaculture. I can imagine a supper table just being kind of like this. A lot of them, they're in their grade 12 year. They're supposed to be prepping for university. <sighs> they, they thrive in that class. Lifelong friends. Still friends. But man, those kids went back and forth. It was actually one of the first times they ever had a conversation together in that gigantic school of 2,600. I think that's a shame. Meander to the outcomes. When people are asking me, well, what are you doing to start? I said, I think we just have to linger a little longer sometimes. I found this. I always talk about lingering cups of tea and paying attention and just letting that swirl, that swirl of tea to slow down the process when I'm trying to get in a relationship. And that we're so fast in school, we're so fast in our classes that we forget to, to slow down a little bit and try to pay attention to ourselves and to who we are in relation. It sounds so philosophical. It sounds silly. But you have to trust me because it'll break up the flow. It actually create the flow. It'll cut the ravine in a good way. I like putting this up. So I'm thinking about these young men. I don't have a great memory. So what I did to understand the 250 kids that were in the school is I got them a, just a big white sheet and they took pictures of each other and they wrote what sustains them and their stories to live by and they took pictures of each other. And for me, I put this right alongside their attendance, right alongside their, their, their calendar, right alongside, and I'd always go back to them and say, so are you sticking to what you're saying? Jaron and Michael. Michael, on the... Uh, Last day of grade 12, he goes up to me, hey, old man. I'm like, yeah, well, that's good. Nice to see you, Michael. <laughs> and we developed a strong relationship. 
Michael's parents sent him to live by himself all through high school in the city. He's from Muskogee. He said he wanted to be a basketball player. He goes, hey, old man, I'm going to go to university like we said we were going to. He goes, when I want to come back, he goes, I'm going to be a social studies teacher like you. He goes, have your job ready for me. I'm taking it. <laughs> this last school year, I'm at the University of Alberta. And I'm in my office, which is very rare. And I hear a little knock on the door. And I open up the door, and Michael Swampy's at the door, and he says, he'll manage the job ready. I'm done. He's a social studies teacher. He's a... Uh, Teaching in Moscow Chiefs right now, he's the department head of physical education. He's going to come back and do his master's next year. What he said he did, what he said he wanted to do, he did. It's not me, it's creating space. It's him. But I have to understand the story to help him negotiate that landscape. Because we know the institutional landscape isn't an easy place to negotiate. We're good. We figured it out. Kids have it. Families have it. JC. She's a master chef, culinary gold, regional gold. Right now, she's a, she's a master mechanic. She's a journeyman mechanic. Brilliant girl, brilliant girl. But her schedule, the way it went, grade nine dictates what you do in grade 10 in Alberta, as we know. And she was all in the non-academic strat. So her first year in grade 10 was 10-2 math, 10-2 English, 10-2 social, 10-2 science. In order to get out of that, the next semester in her grade 10 year, 10-1 English, 10-1 social. There's no creativity in that. She talked to me and said, the start, I never took one fun class in all Greek time. She's resilient. I said, well, what do you love? I love to bake, but I can't get in the baking class because, I'm, because I screwed up in grade nine. Well, let's get you in this baking class. Who knew, who knew that she had a, a magic touch around there? These, these, it's the, they, go, they go, who is this guy? I said, I don't know. She said she likes baking. So the chef's like, well, that doesn't work that way. They need an interview. I'm like, just trust me, Judge. Just give her an opportunity, chef. These are tough. They, they, they have a strong relationship. That's my whole place. Map of the landscape, my trail. They, snow's coming. That's my time all place. That's my home on the farm. What sustains you? That's a place that was filled with possibilities for me. It's actually my dad. I think he was a psychologist. He filled that up with sports equipment at the top. He said, just shoot baskets against the wall, man. No dates, no going out at night. Places are what sustain. My last name was Sarah Road. Now what I know is that in these places that we're working, the personal social context is really important. When I talk to young people and when I talk to teachers, the people that sustain them, what are those stories in their lives? Who are they? What does that look like? You mean, tell me more about that. This is a, this is a particularly emotional sign on Sarah Road. I, I, it'll never be there again. So I'm at the University of Regina teaching a, a lecture hall of 300. And I'm talking about this right now, about personal social context. And there's a young person in the back just squirming, just squirming. I'm like, oh man, maybe I'm triggering. I gotta maybe move, move to a different place. Or I, I, I could see her. And she's like, finally pops her hand up. And she's like, Dr. Lassard, Dr. Lassard. I'm like, yes, oh man, yes, yes. I've got something to tell you. I have a confession to make. I'm like, okay, this isn't church. Like, I, I, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> she goes, my name's Lassard too. And I'm like, oh my God, my dad has a love child somewhere, man. This is really bad. <laughs> I don't even have tenure right now. I, I don't even know how to handle this. Can we talk about this at break? And she's like, no, I've got something to tell you. I'm sorry, I feel so bad. I'm like, can we please talk? This, everybody's just looking. This is a conversation. I've got something to tell you. I'm like, you know that sign, Lassard? Yes, yes. I chopped it down on my grade 12 night. It's in my bedroom right now. Do you want to see it on Instagram? <laughs> I feel so bad. Do you want me to bring it back? I said, no, no, I don't want it back. I said, you chopped it down? She goes, come here, take a look. It's, I feel so bad right now. That's your sign. I just like the name. My name is Lassard. You're Lassard. I thought it'd be cool. Momentum to remember, remember North Belfry. That sign will never be again. <laughs> Lassard Road is gone. I said, just take care of it. I said, I don't think the RM they probably hate that. I said, it's a colonial sign anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Lassard Road. But my other name is King Fisher. I said, I think it's funny. I said, so you have wood signs in my white way, but looking back on the rest, it's all metal match. I chop the hat down. I told her. So, so, my, so my last name's King Fisher in my other place. Uh, what if, it's about creating space, disrupting that space. My dad, when he was 16 years old, he went in the safe and I said, Dad, I want to know who I am. And he brought out those papers from uh, my foster care experience. And I read those good things, difficult things to read. 
bad things to read, maybe good things to read, but I knew where my name was from. And so I got in my car and I drove to the reserve and I got there and uh, I didn't know what was going to happen. I said, I'm here. I said, my name's Sean Lassard. And Misty Glenn Halkin was there at the, the band manager office. I didn't even know anything about where I was going. And he goes, we've been waiting for you. He goes, your sister's been waiting for you. Your mom's been waiting for you. Welcome home. I know that doesn't happen for all the people. A lot of my friends, that never happened. But my community has just welcomed me in since 16. So it's just growing and growing and growing. I'm the director of education of Montreal Lake right now. I'm heavily invested in Montreal Lake right now. Um, those are all my cousins in that school right now. But I, uh, I know that's not the story for all people, but I do feel that there's always a possibility to go home. And I think that sometimes even in these education, educative spaces, when we're learning about ourselves, when we're learning about these important histories like you are going to be today, you actually are opening up a portal that, that, that's, 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 that, that creates possibility because you're actually naming some of these pieces, which gives me permission to say it's okay. I know I don't feel good about myself. I don't like being this because I don't understand it. But all of a sudden, my teacher gave me 10 feet tall. You made me 10 feet tall. You actually validated you validated me by actually introducing some of these pieces for the first time. I'm going to stand beside you. I'm going to stand beside you real close because you open up a space for me. You could do that online in a different way. You could do it in between. I believe so. And it's really, really important that Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, we, we, we engage in that because it just can't be from me. Do you know what I mean? Because it's way more powerful when we're together. Because you open up a space for me. People like that, that teacher who spent a little bit extra time, I'm her employee, I'm getting paid to play. She opened up a space for me to believe in myself about who I am as a cultural person, about who I am and who I could possibly be. That matters. My friends quote that there's a geography in our story. That's not just an indigenous thing. So what are the stories in your life? What are the stories in your experiences? You know, what does that matter? What does that mean to you? What does that look like? <coughs> what does that look like? No straight lines. No straight lines. The lady spirits, through a small dialogue over a cup of tea, seven, eight years ago, they're still going strong. They advised the Gay Straight Alliance in school. This is how you start a club. This is how you suspend a club. This is what you would be. They're standing side by side as allies. They design their own logo. They said, sorry, we want to do our own things. We don't want to ask for money from you. We want to create our own money. So I go there to visit them recently. They've got me riding a bike to make my own, uh, my own juice right there. They have, a, they have a blender on the side of the bike. They've got a sign. I have to pedal. They said, you're a big man. Just keep pedaling the side. Well, I don't want sweat in my uh, blender juice now. Because <laughs> that makes the blender go. You've probably seen it in different places. And then they said, that's five bucks, sir. I'm like, come on. I'm, I'm like one of, I'm, I'm one of your allies here. Five bucks, sir. They're savvy business people. <laughs> but they want to create their own opportunities and experiences. They don't want me as an adult saying this is what we should do. More circles. It doesn't have to be cultural circles, step circles. But it reshapes the possibilities and the conversation and dialogue. That's Regina. I got bored there. I went to university and I said, I, I need to work with kids. A lady gave me $40,000 for doing a speech when I met her in Calgary. I thought she was just joking around. She's a philanthropist, so I set up a program called Growing Young Movers Youth Development with Young People. Hired a non-Indigenous person who's really good at physical activity and wellness. And we have uh, created over 150,000 youth scholarships for kids in four years. All the kids that we hired are all in foster care, just like me. Every single one of them graduated now. And the school said none of them would. But we created a different space. That's not me. That's just me creating a space us co-creating what we do together because they had some other possibility. They could never make a sports team because they don't play club. But they could be youth leaders and mentors and they taught all these great threes over the course of three years of high school. And they're the best. Do you know why they're the best out of high school kids? Because their families are, they've been working with kids for a long time. Their cousins, their nephews, their nieces. <coughs> and man, they're brilliant. Sometimes you take the show on the road. I spend a lot of time at Fort Chip around suicide intervention. And unbelievable kids, I'm thinking about them right now. Took a lot of single plane, a lot, 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 lot of time on my hands to think about things. About co creating and reshaping and renegotiating the landscape. And then they return to uh, the beginning. 
That's sometimes five, sometimes 18, one time 30. Today it's just me. The Red Worm Runners have inspired me as I shuffle sprint, navigate down the dusty roads of being on Cree Nation, wearing red t-shirts, red t-shirts, always. Thank you. All right, we'd like to thank Sean for all his, his words today. And as I was reflecting on him sharing with his set of learners, I was connecting it to how I work with all the learners across where I'm from. Um, I'm Jen LaFave uh, from the Wild Rose School Division of Rocky Mountain House. And we have a very diverse set of learners, as most of you do. And to be successful with all those learners, the strategies that we heard today and co-creating those spaces and taking time to connect those relationships, I think will work with a lot of people in a lot of spaces that we all work in. So, Sean, I'm gonna ask you to start up again, because Terry has a little gift and card for you. So, a second round of applause and for his thoughts uh, before we give everyone a break today. 